Cash receipts journals need to be learned very practically. We need to learn how to fill them in. We need to learn what they look like, how to use them, how to create information from them. Be very careful about these types of journals. It's one thing for us to take this information and put it in to, to a cash receipts journal and create it. There's a very good possibility in the exam that they may give you a cash receipts journal that has been halfway done or it's slightly incomplete. Something may be wrong with it. It's one thing to build something from scratch, but if you look at something that's been created, are you aware of how it should look and are you aware of whether or not there is some kind of error in there? So be very careful when we do this that you're not just saying I'm going to plug and play here. Be very careful that you understand what it is that you're doing. And if you looked at someone else's attempt, you could figure out whether or not there was something wrong with that. So they may not necessarily Necessarily give this question or this type of question to you in a very straightforward way. So be very careful that you, you understand that you've worked with it quite a lot and you know what you're doing. So we'll use the example of Fussy Pet Foods. John started Fussy Pet Foods on the 1st of June 2013. He entered into the following transactions during the month. In order to identify and as a learning tool, I've only given transactions here that actually impact the CRJ. So I'm not dealing with any payments at the moment because I just want to show us how we work with that. So we want to prepare the cash receipts journal and post it to the general ledger. I'm going to deal with that one the second in the second video. The cash receipts journal itself looks like this. These columns in your exam, the best way to do these is, um, is to actually turn your book sideways and to create sort of a landscape out of it. If you try and fit all of this in one A4 page, you can imagine that's going to be a little bit of a mess. So you could actually kind of go over two pages or you can turn your book around. Make sure that you that you find and have the space that you need. Don't cramp yourself up. So instead of working on one side of the A4 page, just use both. Just use the entire open book, you know. So just you know, open it up and use your columns. You want the space because this can get, you know, this can get quite ugly and it takes a lot of space. So I'm going to squeeze it in here, but you want to make sure you get practice drawing these columns out and make sure you're comfortable with what they are and what they look like. Our document number is the indication of where this comes from, where we can go back and trace this back to. The day of the transaction, the details, who the receipt was made out to, the cash register roll, whatever. The folio again is for posting purposes. As we post each of the items to the general ledger, we spoke about that when we looked at general journals. Make sure that you identify and cross-reference between the general ledger and your CRJ. Your analysis of receipts column is to identify every bit of money that's come into the business throughout that day or throughout that particular period. The difference between the analysis of receipts and the bank is just about when you actually deposit the money. And this is just a practicality in understanding that just because I received money today doesn't mean that I'm going to the bank and depositing it today. I might take all the money from today, keep it, make more money tomorrow and then go to the bank tomorrow. So the analysis of receipt is to show you what you received on that day and then the bank and the, the is to indicate when you actually deposit that. So we'll take a look at how we work with that as well. Your sales, we have a sales column because we expect that those transactions are going to happen quite regularly. So instead of putting them all down one underneath each other, remember when we spoke about the general journals, you could do each of these transactions, debit, credit, debit, credit. Here we're just going to create a column and at the end of the month we'll post a total rather than each of the sales. Debtors control, we're assuming that our debtors are going to pay us money in cash. So when they owe us money, they're going to come in and they're going to pay us in cash. And again, instead of posting each one of these individually, I'm going to create a total and post the total. My sundry accounts are for all those transactions that I kind of believe are going to be one off. It doesn't happen often enough to get its own column because that's a bit of a waste of space. In which case I'm going to identify the amount. I post that separately. We'll look at that later and then give an indication of the detail. This you need to be aware of. In terms of your CRJ, classically your columns up to here are normally fixed. So if I say to you in an exam, draw up a CRJ, everything up until there will be fixed and you will always use those. 
those on this side of the line there is a possibility they could shift that if there's money coming in from other places and it happens regularly in an exam they could say use columns for sales and capital contributions for example and not debtors control so be aware that these types of columns could shift we will always have the sundry accounts as well so in between here these columns that you use might be different so let's take a look at these transactions on the first day, on or first of June, John opened a bank account in the name of the business and he deposited 50,000 Rand into the bank account. So let's take a look at journalizing this. What would our document number be? We never ever receive money in a business without giving out a receipt. So even if they don't specify this, you need to identify and give a receipt or you need to give a document number. Your business will never take in money without giving out a receipt, just the same as you would never hand money over to someone without taking a receipt. It was on the first day, it was on, on the 1st of June, and the money came from John. The folio, we're not posting it yet. The analysis of receipts was 50,000, and he deposited this money in the account in the bank account so both of them went in straight away it was not for sales it was not for debtors control the amount goes underneath the sundry because it doesn't belong anywhere else and the details there is capital this allows me to see exactly what I would do with this when it comes to the general ledger the second item he banked cash sales for the week of 4821 so he banked cash sales the CRR, your cash register role, your CRR1, we always number them again so we can keep track of that. And that was on the 7th and it was cash sales. My writing has to be a little bit small. And the amount was 4821. 4821, he did bank that on the same day. When an amount has gone over from the analysis of receipts to the bank, we normally underline the analysis of receipt to show that it's been taken through. And we'll see how that differs when they don't bank it straight away. And this was for cash sales. We don't need to put anything in debtors control or the sundry accounts because it just indicates exactly what that is. We've done those two. Eight, he sold pet food on credit to S Mayhem for 2,400. This is a little bit of a tricky one. The reality here is that this doesn't belong in the cash receipts journal because it has no cash impact. Yes, there has been a sale, but there has been no cash receipt. There will be no movement on the bank account. It is a credit sale, which means we expect we would receive the cash later. And so it would not be recorded in a CRJ at this point in time. There is no cash impact on this. On the 14th, he banked cash sales for the week of 3550. So this again, CRR2, and that was on the 14th, cash sales. And that was for 3550, 3550. I'm not putting it in the bank account yet, and I'll show you why now. Also on the 14th, and watch for this, if there are transactions that happen on the same day, we generally find that the person will go to the bank once that day. They won't go twice. So if we look at transactions that are on the same day, it means that the amounts would have been deposited together. So on the 14th, he also wrote a receipt to be what for 500 Rand, and it was in repayment of a staff loan that John had given Mr. Watt. So also on the 14th, He's written out a receipt to be what? Again, we use the next number in our receipt, REC2, and it was for 500 Rand. The amount goes into our sundries because we don't have a column for it. It doesn't belong in under either sales or debtors control. And it was in terms of a staff loan. Again, this is what allows me to pick the general ledger account that this is going to go into. And what I was indicating here is that on the 14th, there were two sets of cash income, which means that we would only underline the last one to say that he would have gone and deposited that money together, which means that would he banked 4050 on that day. So you can see it's a little bit tricky. You want to be careful tying up the analysis of receipt and the bank column. Although in the bank column here, we've got 4050, that's because we're adding the 3550 and the 
500 together. So you really want to be careful about the detail here. Don't go putting 4050 in the amount column over there. That would be very dangerous. So pay attention. On the 21st, he banked cash sales of 4365 and it was the only transaction on that day. Uh, so we've got 4365, I forget the amount, cash sales. And that was on the 21st and we've got CRR3. This was banked, it was the only transaction on that day and it was for cash sales, 4365. On the 26th, he received 2,000 Rand from SMAM in part payment of his account. So this is in relation to the credit sale that I made. But I do record this now because it now has a cash impact. So on the 26th, we received 2,000 Rand. Again, we would not be doing this without a receipt. 26th, and the receipt would have been made out to S Mayhem. And it was for 2,000 Rand. There were no other transactions on that day. Oh, I forgot to underline that one. So that would have gone straight into the bank. Now here, again, be careful. This is in part payment of a debtor's account. It goes into our debtor's control. It is not a sale. We would have recorded the sale already. So be careful about where that one goes. That belongs in debtor's control. And the last one, he banked cash sales of the week, uh, 5382 on the 28th. There's amounts in there, 5382. And again, that was for cash sales. And that would have been for CRR4. There was no other transactions on that day, so he would have banked the amount straight away. And that was for 5382. And there is our cash receipts journal. So what we've done, instead of creating general journals, and if we think of general journals, each one of these could have been debited and credited. If we created a general journal for item number one, we've got John who put in 50,000 Rand capital, we would have debited the bank account with 50,000 Rand, and we would have credited the capital account with 50,000 Rand. Number two, was a cash sale for 4821. So when we've got cash sales, again, our asset increases, our bank increases with 4821, and we have sales revenue of 4821. So we have general journals for there as well. My point is every single one of these transactions could be journalized this way. And I suggest you give a couple of them a try because you wanna get comfortable with this debit and credit thing. All we're doing is trying to find a more efficient way to do this. All that's left to do now is to total everything to make sure that we've got all of our totals correct. My analysis of receipts, if you add that up, should come to 7618, if I'm not mistaken, which means my bank must come to 7618. And you can imagine that that's quite important. If you look at the amounts that were received versus the amounts that were actually deposited, you know that they weren't always done on exactly the same day. You definitely want to know as a business owner that those two are the same. Our sales amount adds up to 18,118. Our debtors control 2,000 and our sundry amounts 50,500. Clearly, you want to make sure that all of these, your 50, 500, 2000, and 18, 118, add up to your 7618. So we must make sure then that we have accounted for everything, and that way all our debits and credits are going to match. So this is the cash receipts journal. This is how you fill them out. It does take a little bit of time. Make sure you get comfortable with that. If I were you, I'd go and take a full scap A4 um, you know, piece of paper, open it up, and go and draw this out myself and just get comfortable with the spacing and how you're going to draw this thing in an exam.